Hello, thanks for watching. This is part two of my series, What is Literature? A basic introductory series. And this is Professor Paul. Thank you for watching. So part two is just, we're gonna go over the basics, some of the basic terms and concepts associated with literature that you should be aware of, familiar with, and have the ability to use uh, confidently in your writing and speaking. So the first set of concepts and terms I want to look at is fiction and nonfiction. And as we'll see here and with the other pairs of terms that I'm going to look at, the oppositions that, um, that we set up between these terms are very unstable or very porous. The, the boundaries are not always distinct between the categories of fiction and nonfiction. So basically, think that when we think about fiction, we think about something that didn't happen, something that's not true, something that's made up. Let's look at the dictionary, de the dictionary definition again. So, according to the Oxford English Dictionary, fiction is the narration of imaginary events that focus on imagination, and it, they're narrated or told and the portraiture or depicting the description of imaginary characters, characters that have been created in the imagination, in the mind. And this is the fourth definition under the term fiction in the Oxford English Dictionary. So think about what those terms, what that, what that definition means to you and what questions you might have about it and maybe how it might not necessarily cover everything that counts as fiction. And when we think about nonfiction, that's stuff that did happen. It's true, although we'll question what that means by true. And it's, it's factual, we might say. Again, dictionary definition. Prose writing other than fiction, we'll come back to what prose is later. Prose writing other than fiction, so it's defined in, in response to, in opposition to fiction such as history, biography, and reference works. So these are some of the things we talked about in the last, uh, the last presentation. Especially that which is concerned with the narrative depiction of factual events. So that's the Oxford English Dictionary definition. Now notice the, the common denominator between the two, narrative, the telling of a story. In the first, in fiction, it's imaginary events and characters. In nonfiction, it's factual events and factual characters, presumably. So again, what questions do you have about these definitions? Do you see any problems, perhaps, with these definitions? One question we might ask is fiction that's based on true events or characters. Does that still count as fiction? And there is a lot of fiction that's based on real things, real events, either things that are slightly retold, or it could be very broad, like something like, again, Game of Thrones, which uses events from medieval history as its in, in, uh, inspiration. But there's a lot of work that is based more closely on real events and real characters, real people. For example, you might think about historical fiction, Movies about Abraham Lincoln's personal life, for example, trying to imagine events that we don't know necessarily happened. We don't know what these characters, these people's personal lives were like, but what might they have been doing? What might George Washington have been thinking on the night before uh, some battle of the Revolutionary War, right? Um, so historical fiction, well, it's historical, but it's also fictional. So that sort of makes the strict definition a little bit um, creaky. And then when we say something's nonfiction, does that mean it's true? Not necessarily, right? Something can be classified as nonfiction and still not necessarily be completely factually accurate. Because of course, nonfiction is gonna use different perspectives. Every nonfiction work, one history book, for example, is gonna take a different perspective on the same events as another history book. They could be looking at the same reality, but have different stories. So nonfiction, calling it true, 
Well, that can be questionable. What we It depends on what we mean by true because the different methods that people use, the different evidence that they use, they're going to tell different stories. And we also have to point out, again, that even nonfiction uses the elements of fiction, like narrative and character, figurative language, imagery, all these things that fiction uses, that literary works use, are also used in non-fictional works. And in particular, there's a whole genre called creative non-fiction, which is telling non-fiction stories, things that are based on reality, the narrative of true events, but doing so using more creative, imaginative, literary methods. So does this count as true, not true, fiction, nonfiction? Well, we call it nonfiction, but again, the boundaries are a little bit blurry. And what about poetry? Poetry is often, although not always, autobiographical. So in that sense, it's true. It's that person's experience saying, this is what happened to me. But of course, it's also self-consciously artistic. They rarely say, I did this and this and this. Uh, poetry is much more imaginative, much more oblique, much more obscure. But does that count as fiction, nonfiction? Or is it its own thing outside of those divisions? Let's look at a second term, dramatic versus non-dramatic. Again, seems like an obvious distinction, but as we'll see, a little bit questionable. There are some crossovers. Very simply, dramatic works are those that are intended for performance, for dramatization. So plays and films, these are what we think of when we think about dramatic works primarily things that are performed in the theater or things that are performed on television or on screen uh, or on a, a, a film screen. Non-dramatic works are those that are not intended to be performed. They're intended to be read by an individual reader rather than performed in front of an audience. So the standard novels, poetry, short stories, these all come under the the uh, category of non-dramatic, as well as things like comic books and et cetera, et cetera. Anything that's not meant to be performed. So in this sense, non-dramatic is much, much bigger than dramatic in terms of the body of work, a much bigger set of works. But let's think about this for a second. Do we only go see plays in the theater? No, actually most of us don't get to see very many plays in the theater at all, because of the expense and the limited access. Um, plays and screenplays are printed for reading quite often. And most of us who read plays will, or most of us who have any access to plays, it's through reading. So plays are, are often read. In fact, I, I would say plays are more often read than they are seen. And the perfect example of that would be Shakespeare, who is a playwright, but almost everyone knows Shakespeare through reading first rather than through seeing. And people do read screenplays, that is the scripts of a, of a film. It's less often read. You're le less likely to read a screenplay for entertainment than you are to read a play if you're a reader, um, unless you're in the industry, unless you're in the film industry. And of course, novels and short stories are often adapted to stage and screen. So they are turned from a non-dramatic work into a dramatic work, we might think about what does it mean to translate that? How do we transform something that's described in very specific language into a visual image um, in motion with people and, and props? How do we do that in our minds as we're reading a story? Is it the same process of imagining a story that we're reading as taking a story and making a film or play out of it? And within plays and films, they are adapted sometimes one to another. Play, a play becomes a, a film. A film might be restaged as a play. And of course, um, films are sometimes novelized. Popular films, there's often novels written about them or, or written, uh, the, the film rewritten as a novel or book. 
And again, poetry is a problem when we think about it, because poetry is often, not always, but, but often a dramatic situation of sorts. That is, poetry is someone talking to someone else, someone expressing themselves. So it's sort of like a monologue in a play or uh, in a film. And so in some sense, reading a poem, even if you're not the original author, is a form of performance. You are performing that dramatic situation in your mind. And, and there's also the phenomenon of spoken word poetry, where the poetry is dramatically performed. So some things to think about here is what's lost when we go from stage to page? What's lost when we, go, when we take a play and put it in a book and print it? On the other hand, is there anything that's gained? What are we able to see or read or understand or have access to when we're reading a play rather than watching it? And we also might think about what's different between watching something on stage in a theater and watching it on a television screen or a film screen. How are our plays different as a form of performance than films. Obviously things like special effects can't be used as much on stage in the same to the same extent as they are in, on film, but what other differences are there? And then this asks us to think about what do we supply to the written text? That is, whether we're reading a play, a poem, a short story, a novel, what do we as readers bring to it? How do we imagine it? How do we take it off the page? and make it into something else. And finally, just a question to ask, since plays are intended to be performed, so they're intended to be seen and heard rather than read, same thing with films, do we really count them as literature? Certainly they could be art, but should we count them as literature? I would argue drama definitely because of the tradition of reading it and because that's been such a part of our society and culture. But film, I don't know, it's a little bit harder to say if it counts as literature. We can certainly interpret it in similar ways, but it also requires its own methods of examination. Just something to think about. All right, our third term, prose versus verse. Terms you might have heard used to describe writing you probably have a better sense of what verse is than what prose is. So let's think about what these terms are. When we talk about prose, we're thinking about normal written language. That is, any writing that's, that's produced in the normal occasions of our life, it's not measured according to any sort of strict rhythm or pattern, such as counting the syllables or counting the stresses. So, this is an example of prose. It's the first paragraph of the novel Metamorphosis by Franz Kafka. One morning as Gregor Samsa was waking up from anxious dreams, he discovered that in bed he had been changed into a monstrous verminous bug. He lay on his armor hard back and saw, as he lifted his head up a little, his brown arched abdomen divided up into rigid bow-like sections. From this height, the blanket, just about ready to slide off completely, could hardly stay in place. His numerous legs, pitifully thin in comparison to the rest of his circumference, flickered helplessly before his eyes. So this is an example of prose. To compare it to verse, verse uses the white space on a page, whereas prose runs margin to margin, right? The amount of prose that fits on a page is determined by how wide the margins are, how big the print is, right? It's just, it attempts to fill up as much space as possible. So what's written in prose? Well, most fiction, our novels and our short stories, they're usually written in prose. Creative nonfiction is usually written in prose. Screenplays are usually written in prose. And most modern drama is written in prose. So it's what you see most of the time. And of course, all the reading in newspapers, magazines, anything that you read online, articles, textbooks, that's all prose writing. On the other hand, we have verse, which is quantified and measured writing, usually according to the number of syllables and stresses. 
So it's, it's writing that has been measured according to a certain quantitative value. So here's just an excerpt from a poem by Derek Walcott, The Sea is History. Where are your monuments, your battles, martyrs? Where is your tribal memory? Sirs, in that gray vault, the sea, the sea has locked them up. The sea is history. So verse is usually identifiable by the visual layout on the page, the use of white space, right? So what's written in verse? Well, poetry most of the time is written in verse. As you probably know, when you look at poetry, you can tell what it is just by the way it looks. Classical drama, for example, Shakespeare and the drama of the ancient Greeks and Romans is in poetry, in verse. And music is written in verse, right? Song lyrics are written in verse. They have to go to a certain rhythm uh, of the music. So song lyrics are written in verse. Now let's look at some complications though. There is something called the prose poem, which is almost a contradiction in terms to some people. It's a poem, but it's written in prose. Again, some people would say that that doesn't make sense. Poetry, by definition, has to be in verse. But others, other critics and theorists argue, no, they, you, can, you can have something that's poetic, even if it doesn't have the strict measurement. And on the other hand, we have free verse, which is a poem, and it looks like a poem, but the lines breaks and the line links are almost random, it seems. There's no definite structure. There's no mathematical measurement quantitative measurement governing how long the lines of the poetry are. So again, some people would argue it's not really poetry and not really verse. Also, even in prose, in good prose, there can be a rhythm, even if it's not a strict rhythm, like iambic pentameter or something like that, there is a certain rhythm to prose. So it has a musical quality. Furthermore, there are works that there are novels, for example, that have been written entirely in verse. So it's like a poetic novel. Uh, again, mixing genres, something that seems almost to be a contradiction in terms. And there are works, for example, Shakespeare often mixes prose and verse in the same work. And of course, we have new genres and mixed media, things that might combine verse and prose or defy the difference between them. So as with all these terms, prose and verse is useful. We want to know and understand and be able to use these terms, but they're all a little bit, um, a little bit porous. They're all a little bit unstable. So let's review the terms we looked at, fiction versus nonfiction, dramatic versus non-dramatic, prose versus verse. As we saw, these are all useful categories that help us to describe a work of art, to describe a work of literature. Something is a dramatic, fictional work. It is a play that is uh, uh, fictional, it's not, didn't happen, and it's written in verse. But we also saw that these terms can be, again, unstable, that there are works of art that cross the boundaries between these distinctions. We asked ourselves questions like, what counts as true? Again, there can be a fictional work that tells us a truth, even if it's events that don't happen, or it could be based on real events, yet take them in a different direction. And something can be non-fictional, but involve a great deal of imagination and not necessarily be true in some ultimate final sense. We also thought about what counts as performance. Again, is reading a play the same as watching a play? Are you performing it when you read it to yourself? Is reading a poem a kind of performance similar to performing a play? And we saw that these boundaries between these terms are always shifting, they're always porous. Again, performance, fictional, non-fictional, they're not necessarily fixed terms. So we always have to be aware of what we're describing and what we're looking at and how we're describing it. Okay, so that's the end of this, this lecture. Next time, go on to part three.
which will talk about the basic modes or genres of literature, uh, the standard ones, the traditional ones at least, and their major features, literary features and elements. See you then.